Welcome back to the KingCast, presented by the King Economics Division of the Social Sciences Department. I'm your host, Frank Roach. Today, we have the January Monthly Economic Report. With me, as always, Jack Zipper. How's it going? Hey, Jack. Good morning. Great to see you. Jack, I get some questions about the title of our report and the data within the report. And I just want to clear this up for our listeners and our viewers a little bit. You understand this well. Economic data, with a handful of exceptions, is always backward-looking by a week, by a month, sometimes two months, or by a quarter. So the January economic report produced and released in January is about how the U.S. economy formed in December using December data. In February, we'll do the January stuff, okay? That's just how how the data comes out. But it's important for investors, for traders, for savers, for policymakers, households, businesses, to keep track of how the economy has performed to make judgments about how it will perform. Jack, you and I have shared this sentiment a few times together. The best predictor of the near future is the recent past. And so this is why we bring this information to our listeners and viewers' attention, because it's important to do so, and it's the most timely information we have. So I just want to short that out a little bit today. Jack, what do we have today? Mr. Roche, in this episode, we'll take a look at growth, the labor market, inflation, trade, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and a snapshot of financial market price action for the month. I couldn't help but notice fourth quarter GDP was better than expected and clearly not indicating recession. What did we find out, Mr. Roche, from the BEA? Okay, Jack, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and they just released the fourth quarter GDP just this past week, uh, real gross domestic product increased at an annual rate of 2.9% in the fourth quarter of 2022. In the third quarter, real GDP had increased 3.2%, a great number, way above expectations. The increase in real GDP reflected increases in private inventory investment, consumer spending, federal government spending, state and local government spending, and non-residential fixed investment. Compared to the third quarter, the deceleration in real GDP in the fourth quarter primarily reflected a downturn in exports and decelerations in non-residential fixed investment. We think of that as our capital stock. And of course, state and local government spending and consumer spending. Now, current dollar personal income increased $311 billion in the fourth quarter compared to an increase of $283.1 billion in the third quarter. And that reflects higher wages Americans have been making now for the past six months. Personal savings was $552.9 billion in the fourth quarter compared to $507.7 billion in the third quarter. And the personal savings rate, personal savings as a percentage of disposable income, was 2.9% in the fourth quarter compared to 2.7% in the third quarter. These savings rates are relatively low, reflect the challenges American households have with rising prices. Real GDP increased 2.1% for the full year 2022, compared with an increase of 5.9% in 2021. So some deceleration of growth for sure. Now, Jack, one of the things that comes out of this report, and and probably skews the number to the high side, it looks like unplanned inventories rose quite a bit. And so producers were producing at a rate they thought was matching demand. And unfortunately, it turns out demand has been weaker than expected. But inventories do count towards our gross private domestic domestic investment category, the C plus I plus G plus X minus N. So that was really the outlier there. We're probably going to see some of that given back. But the predictions of recession that everyone is talking about for some months now have not been revealed in this report. We'll have to look for Q1 or Q2 to see if that develops. But right now, the economy is doing reasonably well. Jack, that's growth for us. The labor market has seemingly remained tight for some time now, keeping the Fed in their interest rate hiking mode, as we expect at the end of the month, the Fed to write the hike next week again. What did the BLS tell us about December and jobs? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, total non-farm payroll employment increased by 223,000 in December, and the unemployment rate edged down at 3.5%. Notable job gains occurred in leisure and hospitality, healthcare construction, and social assistance. The household survey data showed the employment rate edged down to 3.5% in December and has remained in a narrow range of 35 to 3.7% since March. The number of unemployed persons edged down to 5.7 million in December. Among the major worker groups, The unemployment rate for whites fell to 3.0% in December. The jobless rates for adult men was 3.1%, adult women 3.2%, teenagers 10.4%, 
Blacks, 5.7%, Asians, 2.4%, and Hispanics, 4.1%, showed little or no change over the month. The employment population ratio increased by 0.2 percentage points over the month to 60.1%. The labor force participation rate was little changed at 62.3%. Both measures have shown little net change since early 2022. The establishment survey data showed total non-farm payroll employment increased by 223,000 in December. Notable job gains include occurred in leisure, hospitality, healthcare, construction, and social assistance. Payroll employment rose by 4.5 million in 2022, less than an increase of 6.7 million in 2021. December Employment in leisure and hospitality rose by 67,000. Healthcare employment increased by 55,000. Employment in construction increased by 28,000. In December, average hourly earnings for all employees, not farm payrolls, rose by nine cents or 0.3% to $32.82. And the average work week for all employees on private non farm payrolls declined by 0.1 hours to 34.3 hours in December. Yeah, Mr. That's, that's a lot of info there. And that is a good report. I mean, the, the, right? I mean, come on, you went through that together. We talked about this in class, of course. Um, the, the labor market, in, with some dichotomies developing, seems to be really healthy. It seems to be at a, a labor market would expect at a full employment level of GDP. Maybe while we're having cost push inflation, right, Jack? We're at the top of our business cycle. This develops, of course, uh, good news, we have a dichotomy building between that household survey, Jack, you mentioned, and the establishment survey. And the household survey shows uh, about a million fewer jobs created than the establishment survey. We're not quite sure what's developing there, but it, again, we're going to weed this out in months ahead. Seemingly good situation for the labor market. Mr. Roche, one of the exceptions to our backward-looking data is the weekly insurance claims that come out every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., how are layoffs in America? Well, Jack, I'll tell you what, again, talking about a tight labor market, more jobs opening than, than people looking for jobs. We're seeing this really clearly in the claims data, the, the initial unemployment claims data. In fact, we're seeing lows since the 1970s here, Jack. And again, we have some outliers with New York State last week and California this week in terms of reporting their numbers to, to the federal government, the Department of Labor. But nonetheless, indications are markets remain tight. So according to the Department of Labor, in the week ending December 3rd, the first week of our December uh, look, the advance figure for seasonally adjusted initial claims was 230,000 Americans filing for claims. In the week ending December 10th, the figure was adjusted to 211,000, moving in the right direction, great number. The week ending December 17th, 216,000, awesome. Lows, layoffs are low. Americans can feel comfortable with their jobs. They can even be, feel comfortable switching jobs. And for the final week of December, ending the 24th, this leads the industrial initial claims number was 225. For an average on the month of 220,500 Americans filing for initial unemployment claims each week, which is really impressive. Now, of course, those people that lose their job, we, we feel for them, of course, but there's relatively few indications the labor market remains very healthy. And quite in, in, in uh, contravention to what we'd expect given the Fed rate hikes over the past several months. All right, Jack, so we checked in on uh, growth. We checked in on the labor market. Of course, we want to talk about inflation. I know we had you focusing on this this week. We still have this challenge on our hands, Jack. Uh, why don't you take some time to tell us about what this, the uh, BLS found out about the CPI? So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Mr. Roche, the consumer price index for all urban consumers declined 0.1% in December on a seasonally adjusted basis after increasing 0.1% in November. Over the last 12 months, all the, the all items index increased by 6.5% before seasonal adjustment. The index for gasoline was by far the largest contributor to the monthly all items decrease, more than offsetting increases in shelter indexes. Jack, are you driving yet? Uh, I have my permit. I you have my permit. permit. So have you filled up the car with gas? Yes. So you're noticing, right? It's great to see at the gas pumps when that price is lower. Everyone's happy about that. Yeah, especially in the greater Greenwich area to have that little, yes. little <laughs> bump down in prices. It's really good. 
Yeah, the food index increased 0.3% over the month with the food home at home index rising 0.2%. The energy index decreased 4.5% over the month as the gasoline index declined. Other major energy component indexes increased over the month. All right, Jack, so good news on inflation. The price level still remains high, Jack, and we're sticking prices downward but the rate of change, the second derivative is negative, right? Increasing at a decreasing rate, which is what we wanna see. And the reason why the Fed has been raising rates, right? To tamp down economic output, reduce employment, take pressure off prices. So moving in the right direction, but still we have a lot of work to do on the inflation front. In fact, Jack, let me take over and talk about the producer side, the PPI, the producer price index. Again, according to the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the producer price index declined 0.5% in December on a seasonally adjusted basis. Price advanced 0.2% in November and 0.4% in October. So again, good news, right direction. On an unadjusted basis, the index increased 6.2% in 22 after rising 10% in 2021. And there, Jack, is the real challenge, right? We still have large year-over-year increases going in the right direction, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time just to get the inflation rate down and then more time for the price level to possibly decrease. In December, the decrease could be attributed to a 1.6 decline in prices for goods. In contrast, the index for services rose 0.1%. Prices, less foods, energy, and trade services edged up 0.1% in December after decreasing 0.3% in November. The index less foods, energy, and trade services advanced 4.6% in 2022, following a 7% rise in 2021. So again, good direction, good news. The PPI, that's about the inputs for producers and what they can do to pass on costs to the consumers. And so we always have a correlation between the PPI and the CPI both elevated, but moving in the right direction. So good news there, Jack. Jack, I know you tracked uh, some of the information in our GDP series, which is a much broader series of information. Tell us what the GDP of, uh, series found out about inflation. So the current dollar GDP increased 6.5% at an annual rate or $408.6 billion in the fourth quarter to a level of $26.13 trillion. In the third quarter, GDP increased 7.7%. Or $475.4 billion. The price index for gross domestic purchases increased 3.2% in the fourth quarter, compared with an increase of 4.8% in the third quarter. Excluding food and energy prices, the PCE price index increased 3.9%, compared with an increase of 4.7% in Q3. All right, so more of the same, yeah, Jeff? Yeah. Right, still high pressure, going in the right direction. Um, Jack, we identify this this particular uh, inflation series because we, we want to compare nominal GDP and real GDP, right? And we want to make sure we're accounting for change in output, not change in value over time. And so that's why we adjust nominal GDP by the rate of inflation to get some look at real GDP. All right, Jack, my favorite topic is national trade. Comes from my time in the foreign exchange markets. Let me talk a little bit about trade. Comes from the Census Bureau.gov. It's a sad story for us continually. We try to focus on trading goods here uh, at the uh, KingCast as a more important measure than trading goods and services. We run surplus in services. But we think of jobs in America and manufacturing, it's really a focus on goods. So according to the Census Bureau, the international trade deficit was 90.3 billion in December, up 7.3 billion from 82.9 billion in November. Exports for goods were, uh, for December were 166.8 billion, 2.6 billion less in November, Imports for goods, 257.1 billion, 4.7 billion more. That's probably mostly China. About 45% of our trade deficit was China. Of course, don't, don't forget energy as well. And for all of 2022, the international trade deficit in goods was 1.02 trillion, Jack. That is a monster number. When I was in college, study economics as you are now in high school, Jack, this became something of my focus when trade deficits were at the 30, 25, 30 billion on a year. And now here we are, some, I won't count the years later to reveal my age, but now we're at 1.02 trillion. That is a huge number to try to wrap your arms around. And that represents a transfer of wealth from the United States to the rest of the world that could have been used here to help our domestic economy. Nonetheless, that is a story we have. In 2022, the U.S. trade deficit in goods with China was $410 billion. So you can see almost half, about 45% of our total is with China. Interesting point there, Jack. What we often don't talk about is something called same-party trade. So that trade deficit with China is big and, and a concern, but about 40% of that 410 billion is American companies 
who have who manufacture overseas and ship their goods back to their subsidiaries here to sell as American branded goods. So that's always an interesting element of that discussion. Jack, you've been a, a, a man interested in monetary policy since I've known you in economics. I want to let you take a shot at the Federal Reserve and monetary policy in December. The Fed met in December and raised rates again. Every time the Fed meets the FOMC meeting, they meet eight times a year, they release a statement after the meeting. And we like to take a look at the statement to see what they're thinking. And as we know, uh, the Fed, the FOMC will meet again January 31st and February 1st to as we expect to raise rates again by about 25 basis points. So tell us about the December policy statement. So job gains have been robust in recent months, and the unemployment rate has remained low. Inflation remains elevated, reflecting supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic, higher food and energy prices, and broader price pressures. Russia's war against Ukraine is causing tremendous human and economic hardship. The war and related events are contributing to the upward pressure on inflation and are weighing on the global economic activity. The Federal Open Market Committee is highly attentive to infl inflation risks. The committee decided to raise the target range for the federal funds rate to four and one fourth to four and a half percent. The committee anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to the return inflation to 2% over time. In determining the pace of future increases in the target range, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation and economic and financial developments. In addition, the committee will continue reducing its holdings of treasury securities and agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities, as described in the plans for reducing the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet that were issued in May. All right, that makes me happy that they continue working on that. Remember, their balance sheet ballooned from $800 billion in 2007 to $8.6 trillion in 2022. Really scary printing of money, and of course, one of the causes for our inflationary pressures. Jack, I always like to tell my friends, my students, my colleagues, if you want something to fall asleep with at night, read a, fellow, a Fed policy statement, right? <laughs> you know, so I give you credit for getting through that. Uh, those mundane concepts are really important for us. The Fed is a powerful institution. They control the price of money. We need to know what they're thinking. And that transparency helps us as decision makers. So that good stuff there, Jack. Um, all right, fiscal policy. What's going on in Washington, D.C.? Things are a mess right now, Jack. As you know, we're debating the, the debt ceiling we talked about in the class. Yeah. Yep. Some generational theft here, Jack. How do you feel about us doing this to you? You know, honestly, it feels a little bit disappointing that, especially with the rising age of politicians, that they're not looking out for the younger generation. Yeah, it really is remarkable. You hear politicians talking about the children all the time. Well, this is stealing from children, right? The more and more yeah. we go into debt. And we're fighting over the debt, the debt ceiling. It's going to be raised again, another trillion dollars. We'll go another trillion dollars in debt next year. Kind of messy. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats uh, share the blame on this. Anyway, let's check in on fiscal policy. The federal government ran a deficit of $85 billion in December 2022, $64 billion higher than the deficit of $21 billion recorded in December 2021. Spending was up by $32 billion relative to last year. About half that amount stems from higher interest rate payments, Jack, which is an alarming thing. I think our fourth highest expenditure at the federal level is now interest rate payments. Massive amount of debt. And as rates rise, those payments become larger. And again, because interest rates are rising, motivated by the Fed. Total revenues for December fell by $32 billion. Collections of individual income taxes decreased by $38 billion. That decline was offset by small increases in payroll and corporate income taxes. The federal budget deficit was worth $418 billion the first quarter of fiscal year 2023. So that's October 2022, November and December. Okay, so that's where our fiscal year starts, October to September. And the Congressional Budget Office estimates $41 billion more of that than the shortfall recorded during the same period last year. Revenues were 26, 26 billion or 2% lower than last year. Outlays are 15 billion or 1% higher than last year. And from October through December, they are on the first quarter for the prior year to be a new record for quarterly deficits. So kind of sad there. This is still tied to a little bit of COVID, but just spending way beyond what economists indicate this should be the case. All right, a little messy there, Jack, on the fiscal side has been for a long time. 
politics is a dirty word these days, and hopefully they'll get it together eventually. We need to cut spending, raise revenues, or some combination of both. Jack, we'll try to set you, set you up. You can take care of us in the future, Jack. Senator Zipper, you'll be responsible for cutting spending in the future. How's that? Yeah, with our $5 trillion federal budget balance. <laughs> right. Thank you. Under. Yeah. All right, buddy. Let's run down some financial markets, see how they performed over the week. What did the S&P 500 do? So the December S&P 500 opened at 4,080, which was a high. It, wrote, it fell to a low of 3,783, but closed 3,839, which was still down 241 points. Now, here, Jack, we can do some real-time stuff, right? We know in January the stock market has, has bounced back. Yes? Yes. Good news there. Speculation the Fed might be slowing the pace of, of rate hikes, and the economy seems to be performing better than expected. So that's been taken back somewhat in January. But again, we're focused on a December report, so that's what happened in December. Um, let's see. Um, what do we have here? We have bonds. We have the 10-year U.S. Treasury open at 3.52%, high of 3.89%, low of 3.4%, but it closed at 3.87%, which was up 35 basis points on the month. Again, Fed raised rates in December, so not surprising there. Uh, Jack, we haven't get some serious volatility in fixed income recently. Not quite sure what the Fed's going to do. And we have oh, China reopening for COVID that put uh, upward pressure on things that, that impacted bonds. Uh, let me talk about the foreign exchange market for the month of December, Jack, for the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar index opened the month at 104.73, at a high of 105.58, low of 103.52, and closed the month at 103.52 on the low, down 121 points for the month. Again, this is a, a, a reaction to the European Union, the ECB, the European Central Bank, raising rates in a way they hadn't yet for some time. The Fed expectations they might slow the pace of rates. And so that's sell dollars, buy euros, buy yen, buy sterling. And so that's what we see in the foreign exchange market today. But still, dollar strength is a dominant theme. We just have a little volatility uh, at the moment related to uh, interest rate differentials around the world. Jack, finish us off with the commodity index. So commodities opened at 116.05, which was a high of 116.05. The low was 109.98. It closed 112.81, down 324 basis points on the month. Okay, again, this is another situation where in January, this is reversed now. COVID lockdowns in China come, come off. China reopens, demand for energy products, metals, materials rises. And I, I suspect we'll see in our February report, we talked about January, that this commodity index will be quite a bit higher. All right, Jack, nice job. Let's write it down with some friendly reminders. Do your reading. Do your homework. Come to class prepared. Use your blinker when making turns or switching lanes. Stop signs mean stop. No texting while driving. You're going to kill yourself and always try to buy American. Jack, finish this off for us. That's it for us. Join us again next week and tell hey, your on, friends. Jack. Do I need to change that text? Is it next week? Oh, next my God, week. it is. Yeah. Next Let's month. That again. That's it for us. Join us again next month and tell your friends and family to listen to the KingCast at kingschoolct.org, academics, upper school, clubs, and activities. That's quite an address to my job. Jack, great to see you as always. Have a